call the study session to order on May 13th, 2019 at 5.30 p.m. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Mayor Pro Tem uh, and council members, I would like to change the city manager's report uh, on the agenda uh, to come after G, although G, you don't have any items, so it will effectively be coming right after F. So that's okay. item number K moving up to uh, right after item number G, okay. or item G. So uh, if you will uh, mention that when we're in the yes. meeting. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to uh, turn this study session over to City Manager Rose. Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members, we have two items that we would like to present to you tonight. The first item is being presented by Economic Development uh, Director Libby Tucker, and it is the EDRST uh, grant guidelines. And she will share with you uh, the work that we have uh, accomplished with the EDRST board. And I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Tucker. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, thank you for having me here this evening. Tonight, I want to give you a brief update on what has been done with the um, EDRST, or the Economic Development Retail Sales Tax Board, and the uh, guidelines and the matrix that we use to review the funding applications. So the board met in uh, both March and April, and at the March meeting, they just kind of reaffirmed the guidelines that were already in place, um, um, outlining kind of what, we, what they're looking for, the criteria as far as um, how to evaluate the funding requests that come in. So those were established in 2013, and so they just um, reaffirmed and uh, agreed to keep those the same. The funding matrix that is used to evaluate the individual grant funding or applications that come in uh, through the funding requests did have some changes that they would like to see, and so we've updated those. Um, the matrix uh, is a scoring system, really, that's used when we um, evaluate those funding applications. So it just makes it a little more uh, consistent across the board when looking at those. And so a few of the things that they wanted added were um, to add a category in there to outline what subcategory of the state statute is the funding request addressing. So we can be sure that we're meeting those requirements of the monies that we're receiving from the sales tax are actually spent on things that they're supposed to be spent on. So that was a category item added. And also if the applicant has received funding in the past. And then um, the third thing that they, um, actually Mr. Rose made a great suggestion and, and some of the, they added in some other uh, accolades about that uh, suggestion as well was to uh, in include the number of jobs that they're creating with their project requests, both full-time and part-time and um, a salary range or average wage that they're paying for those. So we thought those were great things to add to the matrix. And so um, we're just bringing those before you to let you know that those changes were made and um, be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, since no one else has any questions, uh, when are we receiving the applications and when will the decisions be made for those applications? Because I know that that's part of the budget. Right. The applications are due on May 31st. So um, I'm, I'm having a lot of uh, good conversations and questions from the community and trying to do a lot more outreach um, to broaden kind of the um, applications that we do receive. So I'm, I'm looking forward to receiving those. And then um, staff will be reviewing them through June 14th and they'll go before uh, the EDRST board uh, on their June 18th meeting um, to review those, and then they'll have presentations from the applicants at that time. Okay, and so, um, Mr. Rose, then will they be brought to us for the budget, or? Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, council members, the intention will be to amend the budget after uh, we have a good sense of the projects that you are going to approve. One of the good things about uh, Missouri is that you can amend your budget at any time. That's unlike some of the other uh, state. Uh, but that's the intention for for this. It, it will, we won't be required to um, allocate any any funding at this point. Uh, the mayor and council will make that decision when you decide what projects to you want to approve. Thank you. Anyone else? 
thank you, Ms. Tucker. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if memory is serving correctly. We had, um, there have been dollars that have been talked about dedicated to Olive uh, within the ERST budget for many, many years, and those for various and sundry reasons have not been activated. Was there any conversation about that? We understand, of course, the larger context of the Olive 170 project, so I certainly get that, but was there any conversation about that? There have been, and I did find in the minutes where there was an amount dedicated and set aside, if you will, I, I believe the amount was around $350,000. Um, if, if, I don't know, if Mr. Rose, if, if that sounds right to you, but I believe that's what it was, and we did find that allocation there. Mr. Rose? Uh, uh, Council um, Member Clay, I think one of the issues of concern is, is ensuring that uh, going forward that we do a good job with, it's kind of awkward, uh, carrying forward those uh, funds that have been uh, approved. So each budget year, if you don't carry forward a project, it drops out and it goes to the fund balance. Uh, so we, uh, starting last year, uh, had a list of items that we were aware of uh, that we wanted to carry those balances forward, meaning that we were carrying those projects forward. I believe that I'm not sure that once the project was approved uh, that uh, it had been carried forward each year. Uh, so I, I, I would suspect that we will, uh, if that is the case, then we will make a new request uh, for uh, the Olive uh, Bullet Corridor project and then council will make some decisions at, as well as the EDRST board whether they are uh, willing to recommend it, and then council will make a decision as to whether you want to fund it. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, whether any, in the two meetings that you had with economic development, did, were there any specific projects or uh, past, past events that they wanted to maintain or keep? Was there anything that they wanted to keep, or are we just starting from, from scratch? We're really just starting over and okay. you know all the applicants just have to apply like they always have i think there's been an increased um, focus on maybe workforce development type projects um, as well uh, to hit that target that we haven't had in the past so a lot of the school board members uh, specifically spoke up about that but um, i think there was a lot of affirmation from the group that they would like to see more of those projects Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I have a couple of questions. The uh, applications are due May 31st. Correct. When did the application, when did you start accepting applications? April 16th. April 22nd, excuse me. And did, I'm sorry, Mr. Rose, did you indicate a date that the final approval would come to the council for, and for a final approval? Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Council Member Kusick, we have not identified a final date uh, at this point. It's contingent uh, on uh, reaching consensus with the uh, council regarding the guidelines, uh, which is we hope will occur uh, today, uh, and then going through a reasonably uh, speedy process for the evaluation of the um, applications that we received and then placing it on an agenda for a council to consider. Uh, so we will have a better sense of what that timeline is going to look like uh, once we take it to the uh, EDRST board and it concludes that process. I don't know at this point whether that's going to be one meeting, two meetings, three meetings. Um, so we're, we're still uh, resolving some of those issues. Thank you. <clears throat> and a follow-up question. Uh, can you tell us approximately how many applicants or applications you have? I haven't received any so far. You haven't received any so far. They're, because they're doing the, the 31st, I think people are, they're, they're pretty intensive as far as what they have to put together. But I have been having some meetings just to um, kind of go over, you know, are they sending in what we're needing and what are they looking for and those types of things. And then once that period ends, if, is there any chance that in the future, let's say in the, this fall, if there's any more funds that are needed that were not allocated, that there's a reapplication process, or will the process be closed again until approximately April of next year? 
Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member Kusick, I believe now that we, once we have the guidelines in place and we have the funding at least available for allocation, you can virtually do it as often as you would like to. So it's not limited uh, to um, uh, simply once annually. Uh, if you wanted to have it two or three times each year, that, that's totally up to the, uh, to the mayor and council. Thank right. you. And and council Member Cusick, if I may, they, um, we have discussed at the meeting having a second kind of formal round of applications start in the fall. So it would almost pretty much um, just start, start up again. So there is a kind of formal public, you know, we announce it, we kind of do the same process again for any of those. But um, as Mr. Rose stated, you know, it can be, they can come in at any time as well. Thank and you. we do have, um, just tentatively, because you have only one meeting in July and August, kind of the way the review process um, has playing out, it, it will probably be August before we can get um, those uh, projects to you. Thank you. And if I could have one more question. Of course. Uh, the state, the, this paperwork states that at least 20% of the revenue, I'm sorry, 25% of the revenue sh shall be used annually for administrative purposes. Are we actually doing that? And if so, what are those, in a, in a nutshell, just very briefly, what are those administrative purposes? Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member Kusick, uh, the majority of the administrative costs are associated with the Director of Economic Development. Uh, so it, it covers that. We're not using the total 25% uh, because it says up to no, basically no more than. Uh, but that, that's the bulk of the cost, as well as, um, so salaries, benefits, as well as appropriate um, organizations that uh, uh, Ms. Tucker would belong to as a part of that profession, and our recruitment, um, uh, uh, travel, uh, that sort of thing. There's one major conference that's held uh, in, uh, of all places, Vegas, uh, but it's the <laughs> ICSC conference uh, that uh, you, you do a lot of work, you do a lot of walking, but you can see, uh, have uh, discussions and meet with multiple uh, companies because they all have a presence uh, there. Uh, and Ms. Tucker, I believe, is going this year. I typically go every other year, uh, so mine will be in 2020, uh, but uh, it is certainly worth it uh, because of all of the companies uh, that uh, normally have booths are, are just the presence. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you. I just wanted to, one quick question that popped in my mind. Uh, one of the things that would, that's happened here in New City, and especially on Olive, is that we're losing businesses. And I just wanted to find out, do we have a defined uh, 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 approach to re retaining businesses? Meaning because one of the things that happens is that they, um, you know, it says it becomes a money situation or it becomes a, whatever that position is, but they, I, I know that there was one particular business that was looking for assistance from the city, but that, I don't think that ever happened. And I just wondered if we have a defined approach to retaining businesses. One of the things that um, our staff is working on as far as an application to uh, the EDRC funds is to reinstate um, the facade improvement and the small business lending program that we had in place a few years ago, but just making it more structured and more geared toward um, the entrepreneurs. So we are um, wanting to reach out and make these funds available to close some gaps, to help continue um, operations, those kinds of things to help make them bankable perhaps. And, and so we'll be um, working uh, uh, with Mr. Rose to make sure we have that nailed down before we present it. But that's one of the things um, we're working on as staff and certainly our business outreach program as I have an opportunity to meet with these businesses and establish relationships so we can know in advance if there's anything they need, they can reach out to us and we can connect them to the resources that they need. If I could just add on to uh, what Ms. Tucker has, uh, has stated. One of the projects that is underway is for the city to develop an economic development strategy. And I think that as a part of that strategy, you will then determine uh, what are those businesses that we should be reaching out to for uh, recruitment purposes, as well as 
you know, what are those businesses that we should really be trying to, to nurture and expand? And I'll give you an example where we certainly have uh, uh, some uh, check cashing businesses, for example, uh, where, where I, I think that they provide a service in the community. You as a council will then make some decisions about whether those are the type of businesses that we should be actively pursuing or whether those are the type of businesses that we should be trying to nurture and expand. And, and I'm just using that as an example to uh, illustrate why I'm it's important to have a comprehensive strategy uh, as you're looking for economic development. And, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, no, 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 go ahead, Steve. All right, Steve. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, just quickly, after the applications come in and the EDRST board reviews them, will, will we be getting all of the applications to review or will we be getting the ones that they approve? How, how will that work as against the matrix? Well, I can share my thoughts on that, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Council Member uh, McMahon. The intention is to provide you with all of the applications, uh, but to certainly indicate what the uh, EDRST board is recommending, as well as what staff is recommending. I, I'm hopeful that uh, we will be able to work very hard with the EDRST board so that uh, the staff and the, and the board will be recommending the same projects, but there's no absolute guarantee that that's going to be the case. But certainly uh, my intention is for uh, you to receive a copy of all of the applications. And then a follow-up on that with the, the new category reg regarding whether the applicant fits within the statutory <laughs> guidelines, does the EDRST board have? An, I'm just envisioning some point in the future there might be a discussion of which ones fit which pigeonhole, do they fit at all, is, going to, is one project going to be completely tossed out because they can't find a pigeonhole for it, and do they have guidance as to what those might be? And there may not be a lot of guidance on that statute of what those things are, but is, is that something that, and, and then if we get that, well, if someone, if they say we can't find this, it doesn't fit the statute, we'll still get to see that one so that we can talk about that and whether we, we determine if it fits the, the pigeonholes or not. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilmember McMahon, the statute uh, for interpretation purposes is pretty broad, so you could almost fit, you can fit a lot of items up under that. Uh, but to, uh, uh, yes, you know, our intention is to bring forward all of the applications uh, and really rely heavily on, on our city attorney, uh, Mr. Mulligan, if he, uh, if it is his opinion that one fits or doesn't fit uh, the state statute requirements. Wayne, did you have another question? And, and my brief quick question was in reference to, and we're preparing for uh, medical marijuana because that's a boom and it's, you know, and it's, it's happening. I know it's not approved. Um, hasn't finished in state or whatever level, but um, just are we preparing for that? I defer to our city attorney if you want to talk a little bit about what actions we're taking currently. Thank you, Council Member Smotherson. On the agenda tonight, uh, there is a, a zoning uh, text amendment uh, before you that, that deals with uh, medical marijuana. And, and what this does is uh, basically uh, uh, um, designates the um, districts in which uh, the uh, the uses will be permitted uh, and it's the first part of the process there may be uh, some uh, additional regulation at the municipal level but the state is still uh, in the final stages of uh, drafting the, the regulations that will, will govern the issuance of uh, licenses uh, to, for instance, dispensaries, which would be the most likely business that would be located in, in University City. Uh, and, and so uh, there, there will be a certain amount of preemption uh, at, at the state level. In other words, we, we won't have um, uh, a great control over the licensees, but we, we still have uh, zoning control and, and some other control to the extent not inconsistent with the constitutional amendment. And, and the state statute. So 
Uh, the, the first step in the process is what's going to happen tonight, which is where can they be located in University City. So that would be for your consideration. The next step would be um, if, if you want to make it part of the economic development uh, process, you could identify uh, businesses uh, who, who uh, want to um, uh, locate in the St. Louis area who, who have a, a license issued by the state for this particular uh, region uh, and try and recruit that business uh, to come to U-City if, if that's the council's desire. Uh, so we're taking care of the first step. We're actually uh, our uh, community development director, uh, Cliff Cross, has done a fair amount of work on this. Uh, and. Uh, and, and I, I think is, is basically ahead of a lot of other cities in terms of uh, identifying uh, uh, districts where they may be located. So, so we're in good shape there. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Very, and very quickly, um, I, I think I heard this from you, City Manager Rose, but I just want to make sure that, it, that it's clear that our, our, our goal is to work with the EDRST Board, and so we have a scenario in which staff recommendations, the ERST recommendations are, are, are very much in sync because it, I, I think you're saying this, we don't want a scenario where you have staff over here and the board over here and all kinds of other things going on. So just want to reaffirm that. Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member uh, Clay, that, that's correct. Uh, I, I think it becomes problematic when you have two different recommendations coming to the mayor and council. Uh, so we will work to reconcile our, uh, our recommendations uh, with not just the RST board, but with any uh, board, <coughs> excuse me, commission that you have. Um, I have one final question. I noticed here that we had the funding guidelines and you made mention of us uh, somehow agreeing to these funding guidelines. So what would you like from us today? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, as long as there are no changes, I mm -hmm. will take that as a consensus that you are uh, in agreement with these uh, guidelines and will proceed uh, to evaluate the uh, applications with these in mind, uh, as well as advise the EDRST board. Okay. Uh, does anyone see any changes they might want to make? Or, or So I think we are in consensus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tucker, thank you. Thank you. Our next item will be presented by Chief Hampton. We've been asked to uh, um, routinely uh, bring forward to you our crime statistics uh, for the uh, city, and I will turn things over to Chief Hampton. Good evening. Let's take a little time to um, get these slides together. Okay, first, this is the first quarter uh, crime stats for the entire city. So this is uh, January down through March, leading us up into the April. So we break it down by quarters as well. And this first part one crime you're seeing um, you're seeing a uh, chart that shows the part one crimes of rape, robbery, aggravated assault, larceny, burglaries, uh, motor vehicle thefts. Uh, not much of a significant change total, and I'll get to a slide that'll show you the breakdown of the total. <clears throat> this next slide, you can compare it to 2018. Now keep in mind in 2018, there was an 11% part one crime decrease. Uh, in 2017, there was a 14 percent part one crime decrease. So the trend is we're trying to trend down. We're trying to uh, beef up any protections, any uh, hardening, target hardening skills that we can do uh, for any jurisdiction, any wards, and uh, any districts that we uh, police in. You can see right now the significant uh, increase would be in the motor vehicle thefts. This is during our winter months. Most of these times up. I could tell you just based off of the percentages, you're looking at about 90% of keys left in vehicles, motor vehicle uh, theft. And what we're doing to combat that, we just uh, launched a uh, program today. 
uh, that we could finally get it out to the public, but it took us some time to get it into budgeting and get these auto, auto theft clubs, uh, task force, uh, steering wheel column clubs, as, uh, as so it used to be called. Uh, back in the day, we used to have a federal grant for those. Those grants have dried up. We had to purchase this on our own. So whatever discounted prices we could uh, afford and uh, work with the companies. And we're passing this out to University City residents only, and specifically the uh, victims of the auto thefts uh, from 2019. So. <clears throat> This is a breakdown comparison by the ward, uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, and you can see a slight decrease in several of the wards except Ward 1. Ward 1 uh, pertains this to mainly larcenies and the auto thefts, or the larcenies that I'm speaking of are unlocked vehicles uh, where a vehicle can get rifled through. Even if nothing is taken, we have to take a part one crime statistic on that. Just the fact that the intent is the fact that they're rifling through a vehicle and their intent is to look for something to take. <clears throat> this is a breakdown again of the um, total crime stats uh, by ward and then by the grand total, 237 at this time last year, 234 at this time this year, of course. Uh, like I say, we're trying to, of course, keep working on the numbers and get them down, but that comes with the proactive approach and the decentralized policing approach, as well as these community outreaches that we, that we do within the community to understand that uh, we're all one community and we're all working together. This is, this is a part two crime, but these are drug violations because I know this was uh, significant from last time. I wanted to break down this as a 2018 compared to 2019, and that breakdown uh, consists of a slight decrease as well. Uh, it's not that um, drugs are not still prevalent within St. Louis region or St. Charles region. It's just a matter of what we're coming across when it comes to specific drugs. This is not for paraphernalia. Paraphernalia is the items that you would mainly have even after you have completed the task of using the drugs. And that itself is a part two crime. So that itself would be more of a municipal charge of the crime. <laughs> Excuse me, this is more on the uh, drug comparison. Uh, you can see the um, grand total of 24 and 23 respectively uh, for each year, 2018, 2019. Uh, marijuana is very, like, like you say, it's, it's kind of downplacing itself right now because the, 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 uh, they say the uh, trend is people are going to other states getting medical marijuana cards and, and going to other locations to try to perfect that, even in the state of Illinois, understanding that they're working on their merit. I think they're a little bit ahead of the game as far as the state of Missouri. The state of Missouri is still working out the fine lines and the litigation parts of that. Let me, let me go back to this. On this is the, the synthetic narcotics and the um, cocaine der derivatives. Basically, you have to keep in mind the fed fentanyl is a very new drug. It's, it's something that is being cut with most of these drugs, whether you're dipping the uh, marijuana within that fentanyl. And the fentanyl exposure is something that risks for all the officers, the canines themselves. And that's something that we have to get trained on because literally we just had an officer go to the hospital uh, with possible uh, exposure to that. It turned out not being that, uh, and that was good. That was a blessing uh, from the testing that had to be done. But Literally, it, it, it causes a lot of problems, not even for the users, but for the, uh, for the people that come in contact with that. Chief? Yes, ma'am. What is a non-narcotic drug? Uh, non-narcotic drugs. Yeah. That, this is classification from my crime analyst, but uh, the specific definition of that, I will probably have to uh, research that and get that to you. The non-narcotic drugs itself is, there's a drug scheduling by the uh, DEA, by the federal government, and they break down of the use of non-narcotic drugs. Um, I can't give you an example of one off the top of my head, uh, but, but for, for sure I will get you an answer on that. What, what specifically would be a non-narcotic drug, or considered a non-narcotic drug? 
these are the arrest totals from 2018 to 2019 in comparison. Uh, you see it's 483 total for uh, 2019. This is just through the first quarter. And understanding 450 of those are adults, 33 of those are juveniles. Uh, the 455 number, that was where we were at last year. And this is comparative, so it is going up. So it is still proactive approaches going on with the policing and understanding that we are enforcing the uh, ordinances, statutes, and laws. The Delmore Loop manpower, and as crime trends are monitored in the region and areas surrounding the Delmore Loop, particularly the East Delmore Loop, we get a lot of uh, we get a lot of blame for things that go on in the East Delmore Loop, and that's something that we cannot police ourselves. It's outside of our jurisdiction. The Delmore uh, Metrolink platform at Delmore and um, near the pageant is, is basically outside of our jurisdiction. So what we have to do is take a proactive approach and target harden within our jurisdiction, our border in the Delmore Loop, which is considered the west end of the Delmore Loop. Uh, going into our efforts um, for per se, be below is the, the overtime dollar amount applied to that Delmore Loop. And it's the, it's, the, it's the amount of overtime hours applied to that Delmore Loop. In 2016, you can take a look at that numbers of 40, approximately 44,000. Uh, 2017, we we're up to 54,000. In 2018, uh, pretty much a boost in the manpower in that because we're going at a larger pace, at a more daily approach now. And it'll be probably even larger for the 2019, but it's more of what our community is asking for, what we're needing, and this is what we're providing on that. This is footage from our Delmore from our drone in the Delmore Loop itself. Uh, these next couple slides are pretty much uh, what the drone can do itself. We have the police department ourselves, we have two drones, and we're, we're in the process of the third uh, that, we ha that we house in the um, police department. I'm sorry, that we house in the police department. So if you see, this is kind of specific, uh, and it's a uh, broader approach, but we're, we're much able to zoom in on any locale, and loot any location. You see Fitch's uh, restaurant, so uh, in understanding the nighttime does not affect us. What does affect the smaller drones is if we have a, um, a um, of course, a thunderstorm, a windstorm going on, because it's, it's up there with uh, camera footage that we need. Um, and right now, I would ask uh, any questions, and I'm prepared to take any questions. Okay, I'm sorry. Mr. Clay. Yes. So thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and thank you, Chief Hampton. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, one, thank you for including the uh, data on the, on the drug violations. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to the drone, how, so in the most practical of terms, like how would that, how does that aid in, in crime fighting or prevention or apprehension? How does it, how does it do that? It, it, it's a very proactive tool that we utilize. It, the technology is, is amazing. I mean, we're able to uh, scan anywhere within the law and reason, understanding that anything in public is not, is not considered a privacy. So we're not talking about scanning through homes or, or scanning through properties or scanning through um, what's it called private walls or fences or, or privacy fences of such like that. We're talking uh, front sidewalk, street, in a car, uh, anything within the public's view, the drone can capture. And we're, and we're up to now deploying that at least twice a week. Uh, and they have to deploy it once a day in order for training purposes anyway, but, and we're still getting more trained. We're close to having our uh, third and fourth officers trained on that. Right now we have a, uh, an investigator as well as a uh, lieutenant, and uh, we're working on two more officers with that. But we work that in conjunction with the fire department, especially with missing persons, um, persons in need. Uh, sometimes we'll get a, uh, almost a senior citizen's call with Alzheimer's that has been deployed, uh, so not only a missing child, and not only for crime itself, but yes, we are able to do surveillance. Particularly, uh, one house in, uh, recently, a drug bust occurred. Not only, not only could our drone be utilized, but St. Louis County had protocol for their tactical team that the, the third drone would be dis, will be um, utilized during that event. 
So, in another, oh, I'm sorry. In a quick update on the shot spotter. I know yes. we talked about that at the budget. When, has that been deployed? And you may have said this before. It, it has not been deployed, but we're looking at a, a time frame now of three to four weeks that uh, is finalized. This is from daily emails that we're getting from Region Power, V5, and Ameren uh, themselves. That's been the, those are all the different organizations that have to come into an MOU. Uh, I've uh, shared with the uh, city manager and the uh, city attorney. Uh, initially, they were asking us to pay a poll, or per poll fee. Ameren was, even though that the uh, poll was sitting within our right of way of the city. So you're just understanding that every time we went up a poll or down a poll just to adjust or take down or, re or move, Ameren initially w had that stance. That stance has been lessened, and the V5 company is now willing to uh, absorb those costs. Mr. Hales. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this is not really a question for the chief, but more of a request of the city manager. Um, relative to the, particularly the car break-ins, mm -hmm. um, or not even break-ins, just unlocked cars that are being stolen, um, we've had a couple of issues recently that we get emails on. Uh, I was contacted by a neighbor um, who had the police knock on their door because they saw that these folks had a ring doorbell and they were looking for footage. Can we put something to that effect about the camera registry and roars and, and, and try to enhance the outreach because I think there are a lot of folks who don't know that that exists and it would probably make uh, the police department's life easier. Mayor Pro Tem and, and Council Member uh, Hales, there are two areas. We're certainly trying to do a better job with communication. If you recall, we, we were doing our videos now of uh, what's happening within the various departments, but also including uh, information in the, in the roars, highlighting uh, the police department and you know, the things that people can do themselves to better protect themselves and their property is uh, certainly something that, uh, that we can do. Uh, but wh while I've got the microphone, I would like to add on to what uh, Chief Hampton has indicated. Uh, for the drones in particular, special events will be a, a key area. That's I think correct. that it will be very helpful. Uh, but the use of technology, we will look at that very broadly. Uh, even for the break-ins that we have, I'm, I know that uh, Chief Hampton is looking at uh, dummy cars uh, where, you know, you might break in, but you can't break out. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so those type of technologies, cars, We'll also look at the cannons that will minimize uh, when we have to do those high-speed chases. So we merely have to get close, deploy a GPS uh, device, uh, and then we know exactly where that vehicle is going. It uh, takes our uh, officers out of harm's way, and it also takes the perpetrator out of harm's way. We're, we're going to eventually get the, get the vehicle. So those are some of the things that we will continue to, to look at. How do we make... Um, University City safer? How do we minimize uh, the exposure that our officers have to uh, unsafe conditions? Thank you. Mr. Cusick? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Chief, do you have an, any indication of how the um, comparison by incident uh, statistics for the crimes in University City compare with the metro area? And um, given that we border several communities that have historically had higher incidents of crime, and we're bordering with the city of St. Louis, and then we also border with uh, portions of Clayton and Ladue where they may not have the, some of the drug problems, et cetera, that we may have. So how does University City rank with the other municipalities around us and throughout St. Louis County and in comparison to the city of St. Louis? Any of the uh, more densely populated areas, the metropolitan areas, we're, we're ranking very high amongst those. Now, in the communities where it's more of a business district where they're closing down at 5 or 6 o'clock, like, like Clayton, they don't promote any nightlife over in Clayton. They don't have any venues or any businesses that I can think of on a routine basis, which is more than maybe one or two businesses themselves. Uh, the banks, they're closed at a certain time. The, uh, the corporations, buildings are closed at a certain time. But when it comes to the, uh, the other areas that we're surrounding, we're ranking very high amongst them, whether that's Wellston, Pagedale, North County Co-op, uh, patrolled areas like Vanita Park and Overland, uh, along on up to uh, 
Olivet, and um, of course, St. Louis City. Uh, so now, as far as having specific numbers, we have not, I have not asked the crime analyst to compare those, but I can uh, try to have her put something together on that. But understanding is also based off of your population. So meaning that a city the size of a 10,000 pop, 10, person population or 8,000 person population uh, with uh, less square mileage footage that, of their jurisdiction, crime stats are supposed to rank at a, a slightly lower. So it's not, it's supposed to be a comparative of your um, like size, like population is basically how the uh, normal comparatives go. Thank you. Mr. Smotherson. Yes, thank you. Um, Chief, I just had one, well, actually two questions, and that is um, in reference to this page that has the part one crimes first quarter uh, comparison by incident type. Okay. And what I, I would like, if you, if you could um, have whoever puts this together, uh, actually break this down by wards, because it would be interesting to see Okay. on this page how this breaks down by wards and what's actually happening where and when if you understand what i'm saying oh, yes. and that's that's one of the things that i i, I would like to see okay um, the other question that i had is is, is about delmar station and you mentioned this before the delmar uh, metro station yes and, and and one of the things that that, that I, I have to deal with and i get calls and that is that we have a lot of residents especially in the third ward that ride bus 91 which is the olive bus that bus goes and it stops at the uh, Del Mar station and there is a lot of gathering at the Del Mar station and that's what I hear and the people ask why are they allowed to gather like they do at the Del Mar station so my question to you because we have a lot of residents that ride and they they ride to the Del Mar they, they use that station right. to catch Metrolink so again how strong is our um, um, relationship with the St. Louis Police Department and how strong is our relationship with Metro because we have residents that ride through there and I can tell you and and my wife can tell you probably a couple of weeks ago you know a fight broke out um, you know it, it's it they they there's there's smoke marijuana smoking I mean it's everything going on and people literally are just hanging out there right we have, a, we have a very strong relationship with uh, St. Louis City Police Department. When they, when they run their analysts and their stats for that particular area is not ranking even in their top 10 of areas that they're trying to patrol and, and knock down within that rectangle, I believe, that Chief Hayden is referring to. And as far as the uh, police patrolling for the Metro Link itself, it, it will be enhancing very shortly. Uh, the approach that they're currently taking is downsizing their police department to a uh, public safety security protection uh, unit. Now, what that will do, of course, uh, you're going, they're going to lose some of the law enforcement personnel, and that law enforcement personnel we're seeing is trying to enter into the uh, workforce out here in St. Louis County at the municipalities or even St. Louis City itself. Uh, but what it will do is put a clear focus on who is the police and who is the security. Right. In the past, I think it's been a conflict of interest from both entities to try to police the same way. And maybe the Metrolink not really, the Metrolink security not really understanding that um, it, they were limited with police duties, that they were limited with police authority. And I think now they will clearly understand that. Of, of course, it's not like some other cities, larger cities like Oakland, where New York, or where the, the uh, Metro Transit Authority are sworn law enforcement personnel. That will not be so now here in St. Louis, unless it's changed by the officials. Mr. Hale. Um, following up on Metrolink, if there's an event on Metrolink, and I, there was a number of months ago, does that get reported through University City and show up here, or would that be handled by St. Louis County if they're addressing it on the train itself? On the platform, everything on the platform is their authority. Everything on the platform, and that, in that particular, like you said, I think you're mentioning one on the uh, in the area of uh, Forest Park. 
-hmm. expressway. That anything under the platform, anything on the platform is still in their authority. And meaning that uh, once they put that in place, that was the that was the MOUs for all. That was the MOU and the understanding for all the cities and jurisdictions that had the, that the uh, those platforms built into their jurisdiction. We do assist and we do get notified right away because it comes nine times out of ten. If you're in University City, regardless of where you at platform or not, uh, your 911 call is going to come through us, depending on the, which tower is pinging off of for your cell phone. So that will be uh, uh, directed through our communications division. And then our officers will still be responding to because the main goal is apprehend, apprehending the uh, perpetrator and, and securing the scene. Okay, thank you. Following that, that incident a number of months ago, I know that there was uh, outreach and communication with Washington's Police Department. And uh, a number of times I saw a U City officer at uh, Big Bend uh, at Forsyth. I also saw Wash U officers. Has that effort continued? It does continue, and it is continuing. Uh, you just it, the we have a couple locations that we have to sure up in in the um, University City area, and that's the that's the Forsyth and that's the Forest Park Expressway. But then we also have to be cognitive of the Delmore Station. We also have to be cognitive of the Plymouth Station. So we 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 understand that you know okay we may only have two. Uh, platforms here in our jurisdiction, but we have a total of two more that are, that can totally be utilized for uh, for quick entry and quick exit in and out of our towns. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Cusick. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I've got a two-part question: part for the chief and part for Mr. Rose. Um, Chief, I've heard from several residents in both the second and the third ward that they're, they're becoming very frustrated with uh, what seems to be continual drug activity, drug houses, uh, selling of drugs on street corners, uh, et cetera. And again, that this is activity that's taking place in both the second and third ward. What are we doing to combat that? Is there, are there any types of innovative initiatives that are being um, tried to combat this drug use and then when I look at the 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 rates of the drugs and that they they say the same it it seems to me from hearing from the the frustration from the residents that that there seems to be some a bit of an increase in drug activity and then a follow-up question for Mr. Rose I suppose would be if there are if there are drug houses or problem houses or locations, are these being classified as nuisance properties and are we able to do anything about these nuisance properties to follow up on that? So if you could give us any ideas on that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll address the, uh, the, uh, the actions of the hot spot policing that we deploy. The, uh, the uh, decentralized approach in general is very proactive with drugs and, and, and what have you. The community action team, that is their focus. Uh, the, um, the, the, um, the collaboration with St. Louis County is still in effect. Uh, we, we, we currently feed uh, addresses for quick response they have a street hit team that if if drugs are being sold on the street then they're going to hit that and we're going to assist with that now if if you're if we're getting um uh, indications meaning if someone is notifying us that that a particular address is of drug um tendencies and drug activity tendencies, then that goes on, that goes on a different list. And that list for us is then the current, um, the current um, like nuisance house list. But yes, but if they're only notifying you and not notifying the police, we can't put that on the list. We need, we need that notification, even if it's an anonymous call, even if it's a, an anonymous email. We have the online capability of crime tip uh, hotline uh, notifications and we need that notification we need that first tip that first lead that says that okay let's start an investigation into this house and and not and and so we can clearly understand whether or not this is a grandson staying at a grandmother's house that's 30 40 years old that's not having a job and and basically having friends over and they smoke down in the basement that's a little different than a drug house 
That's a flop house, and that's a house that's being taken advantage of of the uh, personnel that own the house. She may be uh, elderly, bedridden, or what have you, he or she, and we, we, have, to, we have to address that in a different manner uh, because it, at certain times when we go in, uh, when law enforcement goes in too heavy on a, any given case, then you're, you're sometimes victimizing a victim. If I could respond to your second question, if you could move the uh, drugs back to the part two crimes. Is that it there? Yeah. I think one of the things that we're recognizing is that the part two crimes for drugs is starting to decrease, not at the rate that would make everyone happy, uh, but certainly we recognize that, uh, that it is starting to go down. Uh, I just want to add on to some of the things that the chief has said, and certainly you, you are aware that we're using technology uh, to combat that uh, surveillance by our drones. Uh, we will be introducing uh, at, in the future, near future, uh, the use of cameras uh, where we can identify hot spots uh, and place those mobile uh, cameras uh, in those areas. One of the other issues that I think is important to recognize is that we have a national problem here with trying to recruit people interested in the police uh, as a profession. Uh, and that's not something that's unique to us. Uh, it's something that it's a national uh, occurrence. That was one of the reasons uh, you were uh, willing to uh, make the adjustments for the class and compensation so that we could be more competitive uh, in the market and we weren't losing our good people uh, and we were indeed able to recruit good people. So I think long term you'll see uh, an improvement in our ability to fully staff uh, the police uh, department. I'm sorry, tell me your second question again. I got off on a tangent. Uh, the issue here. of nuisance properties. Oh, and nuisance properties, yes. Uh, if, we, if we are able to determine that a crime is occurring at a property uh, and we are using a great deal of resources to combat those uh, violations, then we can determine that uh, to be a nuisance property and we can actually take the property. That becomes a legal issue uh, that our city attorney would be involved in. I think what happens with many of the drug crimes is that they occur near a property but not on the property. Uh, so that creates some uh, challenges for us because the crime, as I understand it, and the city attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, has to actually occur on the uh, property that's, uh, that's in question. That, that's correct. And uh, we, we do have an ordinance that actually has been on the books for a number of years. It, it's uh, it 20.270 two, uh, in the code. And uh, it, uh, it weighs out uh, the, uh, the activity uh, that's considered a nuisance, a criminal activity that's considered a nuisance, and a, a procedure for uh, taking action against uh, those responsible for the creation of that nuisance. Uh, the, the remedies may include municipal court prosecution, as well as what Mr. Rose said, which is to, to close the property down. And I know the police department has uh, been very diligent in, over the years in, uh, in documenting uh, criminal activity at properties and sending letters uh, to the owners and occupants of the property. And, and threatening action and following up uh, on uh, on it. Um, I know, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I uh, was involved in closing down a number of drug houses uh, in University City, and uh, um, we and, and so we do have the tools. But it, as the chief said, it does require cooperation from the community uh, to some. We the, the police department needs mm -hmm. to know. Uh, if, of course, some, some of it, you know, it has intelligence and just a normal uh, crime fighting. It will, um, it will learn of, of some of these properties, but uh, it, it's very helpful if, if people report it. We have uh, the community informing the police department uh, so they can document it. The other source is just calls for service where uh, they have uh, police reports of activities, sometimes assaults, sometimes drugs, and, and they're compiling uh, statistics or also um, looking at, at various properties and they may say, you know, for instance, this, this property had, you know, a dozen calls for service resulting in eight reports, you know, domestic violence, drugs, what have you. And so then they can, um, they can target those properties for 
enforcement action and work with the prosecuting attorney and myself and coming up with it. So we just need the information coming in from all sources so we can identify uh, the properties we need to go after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so I would like to, um, uh, I'd like to adjourn this uh, study session. All in favor? Opposed? Adjourn. Uh, we'll meet up front um, as close as we can to 6.30.